All right. How how is the security analysis project coming? Those of you that joined me on Sunday, have you gotten started on the spreadsheet? Yeah. Good. Excellent. And I've got the uh, the video that I did. I just recorded that session. So that's uploaded to the YouTube channel. If you go back to announcements, I've got a link there to the particular playlist. And it's, uh, it's in uh, FN342 lectures is the playlist. So if you want to go back and check things, I was trying to bookmark those uh, various topics that we talked about as well. So if you want to just go back and check something in particular, look down in the in the section below the video and I've got time links there. You can click on that if that's helpful. Um, any other questions? Uh, those of you that aren't doing the pro formas, um, you're working probably on getting a cost of capital and first before you can do that, you got to get a beta. How is that going? Are you having any difficulties there? I don't see anybody raising their hands. So. Um, how about uh, getting growth rates? I mean, you want to go back and you want to get some sort of historical benchmark as a starting point, but remember, you want those four forward-looking factors. We want to look out into the future. That's your real value added. And you're just going to make some guesstimate. I'm not going to hold you to a very detailed analysis of precisely how much those forward-looking factors might influence the uh, the growth of the firm in the going into the future um, you know, now ultimately if you're doing this for real with real money you would absolutely want to come up with a more detailed analysis in fact we could use that pro forma financial statement that the the other team member in your team is developing and we could actually come up with some uh, much finer uh, gradations of how this expectation is going to affect your uh, growth of cash flows into the future. All right, so nothing there. Let me uh, switch over here then to the slides. And why am I not in here? Oh, there I am. Let me get out of the way. What I thought I would do first, um, I always have some applications. Um, basically, they're something like homework problems. Some of them are a bit more complex. And I thought I'd spend a few minutes just going over the, there are three applications that I have here that relate to chapter 10. So we're talking bonds. And uh, the first one is extremely basic. Hopefully you won't have any difficulty there. And then we'll look at a example of calculating duration. And we'll also look at an example of calculating a, uh, uh, using duration rather to calculate the volatility of a particular investment choice between two different uh, types of investments. Um, so let's do that first. And then uh, whatever time we have left, we'll jump into chapter 13, which is looking at portfolio performance or portfolio management. How do I evaluate how my per portfolio is doing vis-a-vis -vis some sort of benchmark? All right, so first on to the applications. And this first one really shouldn't give us any difficulty at all. Let me grab a pencil to jot this down. If you want to follow along, if you, I, I, sorry, I didn't mention to, uh, to you, any of you to bring a financial calculator along, but actually, yeah, I always ought to have one handy. I've got uh, two somewhere, yeah, just in case one of them gets away. <laughs> um, so either that or we can go online. Uh, there's one that I found under calculator.net. Uh, that does a pretty good job. In fact, that's the one I'm going to be using today to uh, to do these calculations. So here, this first example, we're just looking for a uh, YTM, a yield to maturity. Um, so we've got a bond with a coupon of 11%. Uh, it has eight years left till maturity, and it's currently priced at $1,130. So if we go over to our calculator... This particular one, um, I'm looking for yield. So in this uh, online calculator, what I do is I'm just going to use the I uh, per Y tab here. It's already set in a per year units. 
So all I need to do is to enter my particulars here. So I'm going to enter my eight, oops, eight years. Um, and then I've got a present value. And that is, I, let's, let's pretend that we're buying this thing. So I'm going to make that a cash outflow of 1130. And then our periodic payments at 11%. Uh, oops. At 11%, that would be $110 per year. And then I've got a future value of 1,000. So I've got all my inputs. Now I just want to do a calculate. And lo and behold, I get a uh, yield to maturity of 8.68%. So you should be this this should be kind of old hat to you in terms of how to calculate it. Ideally, you're using your uh, financial calculator. You just plug in your N, your PV, your FV, your payment, and your uh, calculate your I in this case. Uh, so let me go back to our. Oops, what happened to that? Come on here. And so yes, there's our there's our result is 8.68 percent is the yield to maturity. Obviously, if this were a bond that had a callable feature, and um, you know I wanted to do YTC instead, I would just look at the the first year or the first period that the time to the first period that I could have the bond called. And uh, so if it, if it had a call that might kick in in five years then my number of periods would be five instead of eight. All right, so that one was very basic. This next one is a little more complicated. You can do it one of two ways. Uh, in terms of time on a test, it's probably easiest to use the shortcut formula. I just, uh, personal, uh, personally, I'm not a big fan of the shortcut formula because there's absolutely zero intuition that I get out of it. Uh, so I like using the, the summation version of it. Um, so here's our bond. We've got a coupon rate of 6.5%. Face value of 1,000, of course. Maturity in five years. And a yield to maturity of 7.5. So five years and 7.5 is our market rate. So the first thing we need to do with this bond is to come up with the... Uh, the price of the bond. Uh, what is it valued at today? So again, we can go back to our calculator here. And so in this case, we're looking for a PV. So I'm going to click that little tab. And I have five years. To maturity, I have a uh, market rate of seven and a half. So that's correct. I have a payment of $65, and I have a future value of 1000 so I'm all set. Just hit the Calculate button, and I get a present value of $9.59 and 54 cents. All right, go back here. So there is my price. Okay. Now, to get duration, as I said earlier, I can use one of two formulas. This is the first one. This is the one that has a lot more intuition. Might take you a few more minutes to calculate it. Um, but it certainly, you can see if you're making errors more easily in this. Uh, so it's the sum of the cash flows discounted back to today for each period divided by the overall price, which is really the sum of all the discounted cash flows. So we're getting what percent of discounted cash flows do we get in the first period, in the second period, in the third period, and so forth. And then we just simply multiply that decimal uh, representation of percent by 
the period that we're looking at. So in period one, it's times t, little t is one. In period two, little t is two. So let's, let's actually look at this calculation here. So for, um, for t equals to one, I'm going to have my first cash flow is $65. I'm going to discount that at my market rate of 7.5% for one period. All right, so here's my, there's the information right there. Now, uh, let's see here. Hang on a second. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Sorry. That's what I wanted to do. And that's not showing up to you guys, is it? Nope. Come on. And that's not showing up. I don't know why this uh, this particular thing doesn't work. There we go. I, I guess I just have to go half screen. Uh, must be something related to the iOS here that uh, when I'm only a quarter screen, it doesn't uh, feed through to the uh, HDMI for some reason. So here's the calculation. Um, I've got my $65 cash flow in period one. I'm discounting it at the market rate of interest for one period. And that the value of that is approximately $60.46. Now, what is that $60.46 of? Well, that's part of all of the cash flows that I'm going to receive in present value sense. That sum is $959.54. So 60.46 divided by the 959.54 tells me that that's about 6.3% of the cash flows that I'm going to receive back on this bond. So about 6.3% I get back in that first period. So that is my, uh, my, de my decimal equivalent, of course, is 0 0.063 times my uh, period, which is, in this case, 1. So now that becomes simply 0 0.063. And then I do the next period, so $65 discounted for two periods now at 7.5%. And I still scale that by my price of my bond, $959.54. And that result I multiply by two because I'm, in, I'm getting these cash flows in the second period. And that's going to be, uh, percentage-wise, that's going to be a slightly smaller percentage in fact, we could actually calculate that. Uh, let's get rid of this mess. Let's say 65 divided by 1.075 raised to the second is equal to $56.24. And so 56.2466 divided by 959 and 54 cents is about 5.9 ish percent so now what i'm going to do over here is i'm going to take my my 5.9 times 2 so that's going to give me 0 0.118, right? And I keep doing likewise for the third period, for the fourth period, for the fifth period. And remember, of course, on the fifth period, which is our last, uh, that's the maturity of our bond, we're also getting the $1,000 face value back. And then I add all of those guys up. And since these are annual payments, I'm still in years. Now, if this was a semi-annual bond, the number I get down here would be in six-month periods. So I would have to divide that by two to get it back to years because I always want duration stated in terms of years. In this case, I don't have that problem because my payments, my coupon payments are annual rather than semi-annual rather than quarterly. So here I have a duration of 4.41 years. 
for this particular bond. Okay? Can anybody give me a sense of what that what that means to you? What what does that 4.41 mean? First off, is is it in the right direction? Well, the answer is, yeah, I've got a coupon paying bond. I know that if it was a zero, the duration is equal to maturity. But because I'm getting some of my cash flows back earlier, that kind of brings that maturity back to me. It, it makes it a little bit closer, the effective maturity. Remember, that's what duration is, effective maturity. So yeah, 4.41 makes sense. This isn't a particularly huge coupon. Uh, so, you know, coming back uh, about a little more than half of a year uh, also sort of makes sense. So from just kind of a gut check, it looks like my calculations are probably right. But what does that tell me? What's the definition of duration? You can tell me in either your own words or what is it straight out of Google. It's like the sensitivity of your either stock or portfolio of the interest rates, changing interest rates. Yes, right. Thank you, Alex. Excellent. Yeah, so it tells me how sensitive is this particular bond to small changes in interest rate. And in fact, this time period, if I hold that bond, to 4.41 years and there are only relatively small changes in the market rate of interest, I will ultimately be able to predict exactly what I get back. Uh, so if I'm creating a bond uh, portfolio so that I can pay out on a, on a pension, um, I'm going to pick this particular bond if my payout is in 4.41 years from now. Uh, and then even if the rate goes up to 7.6 or 7 or down to 7.3 or 2, um, I'm still going to be relatively assured that I will have sufficient money to pay out uh, for that particular uh, period. Okay. Now, here's the shortcut formula. And eh, I thought I had fixed it. Um, Hang on just a second. Just double check that I'm getting everything right. I had written this in before, but because my uh, sp my PowerPoint reloaded, it got rid of everything. There we go. Okay, so this is the shortcut formula, and more or less I'm just plugging and chugging, and of course I get the same answer. 4.41 years. So again, the reason I, I'm going over these examples is that out of that particular chapter, these are the things I really want you to take away. I know you've done some homework on this, but this is just one more uh, exposure to this sort of thing. And from a pedagogical perspective, it's always good to see something again. And in fact, it's good that we have some sort of time space between when you last did the homework and when we're working on this and then you're going to review it for the exam. That's going to help solidify that in your head and allow you to better remember this material and be able to use it on the, uh, on the final exam. And then the last one I want you to think about is, is an application of duration. So here I am, I'm a fixed income portfolio manager. I'm currently evaluating two different strategies that I might want to use here. They're both government bonds, so I have zero default risk in this case, but I still have interest rate risk. And I want to, to make sure that I'm minimizing my exposure. So here are the bonds. Um, I've got a five-year bond with a maturity in five years and a modified duration of 4.83 years. I have a 15-year bond with a modified duration of 14.35 years. And then I have a 25 year bond with a modified duration of 23.81. So my two strategies over here 
Strategy one is to put half, I've got, by the way, I have $10 million that I'm putting into this. And strategy one is to put half of that money into the five-year bond with a 4.83 modified duration and the other half into the 25-year bond. So what are we doing here? What we're doing is we're trying to get a modified duration on that portfolio of two bonds that is approximately equal to this middle bond. So the second strategy is to put all of my money into the 15-year bond. So now what I want to look at is how sensitive are each of these portfolios to a change, a relatively small change in interest rates. And I've actually fine-tuned my expectations here about this. And I, I have some ideas of how the yield curve is going to shift. All right. So I have 5, 15, and 25 years out here. And the yield curve, just for those of you that may be a little fuzzy on, oops, come on over here. If you're a little bit fuzzy on the yield curve, can somebody tell me what's on the x-axis of the yield curve? Think back to economics. I hope you looked at this in economics. If, you're not, if not, think back to financial markets and institutions, FN 316. Years, like time to maturity. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Zach. Time to maturity. All right, and what's on the uh, y-axis? This one's, yes, yes, thank you, Alex. Yield. All right, so what I'm looking at here is I've got five years, I've got 15 years, and I've got 25. So I'm just gonna focus on, on those periods. And let's say that I've got a upward sloping yield curve like this. So here's my five year, here's my 15, and here's my 25. Now, if I go back to my slide, and I'm not going to do it here because it's going to wipe out my, uh, my little blackboard here. Uh, what I will do, though, is I'm going to look on my, uh, my computer. So what I said was that we are expecting a 75-point basis point uh, decline in the five-year. Twenty-five point increase in the fifteen year, and a fifty point increase. Oops. Ah. Fifty basis point increase in the twenty-five year. So let's see. We've got okay. Twenty-five basis points up, fifty basis points up, and seventy-five down. So now I've got my new yield curve. The slope is increasing in my yield curve. So that's my expectation. Now let's go back here. What does this translate to in terms of volatility of the value of my portfolio? That's the question we're here to answer. We have our modified duration values here. We know what our expectations are about the changes in the yield curve over the next period of time, whatever window we're looking out over. Now we can take those two pieces of information and compare the two strategies. So in strategy one, I've got that five-year bond with a modified duration of 4.83. Remember, there's always a negative in that formula, so it's a negative of the modified duration times the number of basis points that it, the uh, rate is expected to change. So in this case, again, it's going down by 75 basis points, or um, I could call that 0.75%, 
or I could write it like this, 0 0.0075. All right, so 0 0.0075 negative times a negative 4.83 means that the value of my bond in that, uh, in, in that, with that maturity is going to go up by 3.6225%. So I have 5 million in that uh, particular maturity. Um, it's going up by that amount. And so the new value of that bond is going to be 5.181 million. I do the same thing for my 25-year bond because that's where the other half of my money is. And that one has a modified duration of 23.81. And I'm expecting that yield to go up by 50 basis points or 0 0.005. So that gives me a negative, a decrease in the value. Because remember that inverse relation between yield and price. So it's going to go down by about 12%. And on $5 million, that means that the new value of that is going to be $4.4 million approximately. Add those two together, and so the total market value of my portfolio with that change in yield is now, instead of $10 million, it's gone down to $9.585 million. And then I look at strategy two, do the same exercise. In strategy two, we're expecting the yield on the 15-year to go up by 25 bips, and it has a modified duration of 14.35. And so times the 0 0.0025 gives me a three, a little more than 3.5% decrease in price. And on 10 million, uh, that ends up giving me a portfolio value of $9.64 million. So now I'm comparing this change in price to that change and I see that the 15-year bond has less volatility given my expectations about the change in yield. Okay, so this is a little more uh, complex problem. I've got finer tunes on my, on my expectations. So instead of just saying everything goes up or everything goes down, I've got a shift in the slope of my yield curve here. But that's the way I would manage that. So I would say, well, in this case, if given my expectations, I like strategy two over strategy one. Even though with different expectations, I might uh, change that. I might, I, I might actually prefer strategy one. So I might even look at multiple possible outcomes in the future and do some sort of waiting scheme. You know, okay, this is... This is the most likely, and I think it's 50% likely, but there might be two other shifts that I want to consider, each of those 25% likely. So I'm going to look at how those shifts affect the price of my portfolio, the value of my portfolio, and do some sort of weighted scheme and uh, get even a finer tune on this. Okay, questions about uh, how I did any of those? In particular, duration and this little exercise here looking at uh, the sensitivity of, a, uh, uh, of an immunized portfolio. Everybody all right? Okay. Let's go on then. Close that one up and get back to lecture. Okay, so Chapter 13 gets into looking at how do I evaluate my performance uh, when I'm picking a portfolio. And, you know, on the surface of it, I, I would think that that's a relatively simple task. And in fact, a matter, it's actually a very complex task. And, uh, and there are multiple ways in which I can judge the performance of a portfolio, none of which are perfect for all situations. So really, again, you know, what are we looking at? We're looking at, can we truly beat the market? We might say we have an alpha, but is that alpha truly more than just an aberration, a statistical aberration? I've got to prove it to my clients that it's more than just a, statistic, a statistical aberration. 
Now, I can start off by just simply looking at raw returns. It's a very naive performance measure, but it might be one that I could sell to my clients, not if I'm ethical, but I certainly want to think about raw performance, especially if the raw performance is good. But what, what else crops in there? What, what sort of problems do I have if I'm just looking at raw performance? Well, the key problem, no adjustment for risk. I might have an extremely risky portfolio, so of course the raw return ought to be quite high. But is that due to risk or is that due to my uh, great acumen in picking a particular set of securities that are undervalued or picking a, sec a sector or an industry that's going to outperform? I, I don't know the answer to that question because I don't know how much risk there is in that portfolio. If I'm just looking at raw returns. The other problem, I'm not comparing it against a benchmark. So I might say, hey, I got 20% return on this portfolio. And you think, hmm, 20%. Gee, that sounds, that sounds good. What I didn't tell you is that the market got 25% that period. <laughs> so 20 is not doing so great, right? So I need some sort of benchmark by which to compare that raw return as well. So I need to deal with the risk adjustment and I need to deal with the benchmarking uh, issue. That's basically what this chapter is all about. And we're going to use different measures of risk and we're going to use different benchmarks. And that's why we have so many different measures to come up with and analyze this. Some are better in, in particular situations than others and vice versa. All right, so the classics, uh, we're going to start with the Sharpe Ratio. You probably already heard about the Sharpe Ratio if you've done any sort of trading or, or uh, dealt with the market, uh, done any reading prior to this class. The Sharpe Ratio is, is a ratio that was developed by Bill Sharpe, um, ergo the name Sharpe Ratio. Now, basically what the Sharpe Ratio is, it's a very simple calculation. I'm looking at the return on my portfolio. This is the actively managed portfolio that I'm, I'm putting out there and trying to sell to clients. And I'm subtracting from that the risk-free rate. So what I'm getting up here in the numerator is an excess return, right? Or I've also used the uh, term risk premium to describe that. It's the risky return minus the risk-free return. Both of those words uh, describe that. Now, I have to scale it by my measure of risk. So I'm always looking for market risk premium or, or risk premium rather in this case. I don't know if this is a market, could be, but um, so I'm looking at risk premium scaled by measure of risk. So I, wanna, I, I want to uh, figure out what that is. And in this case, in the Sharpe ratio, it is the standard deviation of the returns in the portfolio. So what's, what's good about that and what's not so good about that? Remember back in chapter, I think it was chapter 12, we were looking at diversified and undiversified risk. What is standard deviation capturing? Is it diversified risk? Is it undiversified risk? Or is it both? Nobody remembers? Take a wild guess. You got one out of three chance. I would guess both. Okay. Yeah, good guess. 
Thank you, Brett. Yeah, it's total risk. So is that good or bad? Well, if I have a well-diversified portfolio, if my returns are R sub P returns are those returns of a well-diversified portfolio, standard deviation of the portfolio is approaching the systematic risk. Right? Because I've gotten rid of all that undiversified, undiversified risk. All right, I've gotten rid of the idiosyncratic portion of that risk. All I have is systematic risk. So in that case, yeah, it's fine. But if I have a very uh, small set of securities in my portfolio, I'm actually scaling my risk premium by risk that I don't need to take on. So I'm actually uh, I'm, I'm actually creating a bias against undiversified portfolios by using the sharp measure. And I'm going to skip over the Sortini for just a minute to to do a comparison head to head between sharp and the trainer ratio. Again, trainer is the person who developed this ratio, or go the name trainer ratio. The key difference, of course, is in the denominator. Trainer said, well, instead of using total risk, let me use systematic risk. So regardless of how much total risk there is, if I use my beta, I'm only looking at that systematic component, that priced component. Now, the, the problem with the trainer measure is if I have a very undiversified portfolio and I leave it that way by itself, I'm probably not going to get as much bang for my buck because I'm taking on risk that I could easily get rid of. So what we're going to see is that actually the trainer ratio is good for evaluating uh, undiversified portfolios or even individual securities that I might want to add to an already diversified portfolio. But I would never want to hold these things in isolation. In fact... Uh, we won't get to this in this class, but in a portfolio management class, there's this really cool technique called the trainer black uh, method that allows you to mix a actively managed portfolio with a passively managed portfolio, or i.e. the market, if you will, and optimize your alpha that you get out of those two. So you're taking this very Undiversified, uh, undiversified portfolio, which has a lot of uh, idiosyncratic risk in it, but you're blending it with a very diversified portfolio in such a way that you maximize the alpha while getting the benefits of the diversification of the market portfolio itself. So that's if you're interested in that sort of thing, look it up. It's in the back of uh, the Bodie Kane Marcus Investments textbook, Trainer Black. Um, and that's also the same trainer. Uh, Black is also of the Black-Scholes option pricing model. Fisher Black is the kind of the mathematician mind behind a lot of what we see in finance. Uh, Sortini is just a kind of a variation on Sharp, and instead of scaling by the standard deviation on the portfolio, the Sortini ratio says, well, wait a minute. I don't mind standard deviation on the right side of the distribution. What I don't like is standard deviation on the left side. So why don't I just scale by that? And so if here's an example of the two calculations. So if I have, here I'm calculating my squared differences from the mean. And so in the Sharpe ratio, I use every single year, all six years. Uh, in the Sortini, I only use those periods where the return is below the average. In other words, I'm going to have a, a negative differential. So if I look up here, here are my six years. And if I do the average of those, I get a 5% average. And so my, uh, my standard deviation 
is the square root of all this mess, and it is the uh, return in period i minus the average return, and I'm going to square that, and then I'm going to divide by uh, 6. And uh, actually, this is a summation. t equals 1. Or, sorry, sorry, that's not t, that's i. i equals 1 to 6 and when I when I uh, so when I do that I end up here with a sum of 132 and I divide that by uh, 6 and I end up with a and take the square root of that I end up with a standard deviation of 0.05 now in the Sortini the only values I'm going to count are the periods where I have a return below the average return over the whole period. So here it's period three, year three, and year five. So you'll notice that they only have a uh, positive value in those two years. The other years we don't even bother counting because that's, you can think of that as sort of good variation, good volatility. And so the Sartini measure ends up with a scale factor that uh, is smaller and of course gives you a higher ratio here. So that's sharp and then the variation on sharp and then trainer where we change the the, the risk uh, measure to a systematic risk and then we have Jensen's alpha which is another classic that you always hear about people talking about alpha in search of alpha you know chasing alpha whatever you know it, what, what is alpha? Alpha is basically the return I'm getting more above and beyond what I should be getting conditioned upon the capital asset pricing model or whatever pricing model you choose to use. Maybe it's the Fama French three factor. Maybe it's the Fama French six factor. Maybe it's the Hugh et al. five factor, Q5. Um, let's assume for the moment though that it's just a simple one factor cap m where beta is our measure of systematic risk so here is the beta of the portfolio um, here is the expected return on the market and in the bracket or in the uh, yeah in the brackets is the market risk premium because i'm subtracting off the risk free rate and multiplying that by the beta of the portfolio and then adding the risk free rate to that that is my cap m and Note here, very important to note, that this is risk-adjusted. So if the beta of my portfolio is other than 1, I'm factoring that in. And then I subtract that result from my actual return on the portfolio. If that's 0, then I'm getting exactly what I should be getting, given the level of risk that I'm taking on in my portfolio. If that thing is positive, then I'm getting some positive alpha. And positive alpha means I always want to buy that because I'm getting more than I should be getting. I could be getting a negative alpha, which means that's a stock that I want to short. In other words, that portfolio is getting less than it should be getting, and it should drop in price in the future. Okay, so that's short version of Jensen's alpha. And you might uh, recognize this graph. We saw this back in, uh, I forget whether it was first presented to us in chapter, I think it was chapter 12, right? The SML, security market line. And so here we have three different securities, A, B, and C. Portfolio A plots above the SML and has a positive alpha. So here is where it plots. This is where it should be, according to cap M, but it actually ends up being up here. So we can think of that as a positive alpha because, well, if we come back here, look, instead of getting the risk-free, we're getting more than the risk-free. Plus, we're accounting for the level of risk, too, on this particular portfolio. Uh, portfolio B 
is getting exactly what it should get, so it has a zero alpha. It plots on the SML line. And then portfolio C plots below it, it's actually getting a negative alpha. That's a security we want to sell. Another method of calculating alpha, um, I'm going to jump right over to the, uh, to the spreadsheet here because I think this is the most useful way of uh, viewing it. So remember what I said about uh, you know, risk adjustment and, and maybe, it's, maybe it's truly there or maybe it's some sort of statistical aberration? Well, this is one way that I can tell the difference between the two. If I run a regression over time, so here's my data up here. I've got my returns. I have five years here. Obviously, I'd want a few more observations than that, at least 20, 30. So maybe I need to do it on a monthly basis, and that's all right. Uh, I could do it on quarterly if I have a, a longer span of time. But I have returns on my security and returns on the market. I also have the risk-free rate <clears throat> Excuse me, over that period of time. So you'll notice that in year one, the risk-free rate is 3%. In year two, it goes down to 2 In year three, it goes up to 4 So I'm also capturing that piece. Now, I can use that risk-free rate in that period and get an excess return on both the security and on the market. Those, that or rather, that is the data that I will use to run my regression. And here we're using the regression um, add-in um, in the data analysis package in Excel. And I'm getting an R squared and an adjusted R squared. And remember, I don't care what the R squared is or the multiple R. What I care about is what is the adjusted R squared. About 40% in this case. That's actually pretty good. If you look at a bunch of these regressions, 40% is, is relatively decent. If we use the Fama French three-factor, we might be able to bump that up, and obviously the six-factor would potentially bump that up too, or at least Fama and French would argue that it does. Now, down here is the, is the very important uh, piece that I want to look at. And instead of looking at the coefficient on the slope, because I'm after alpha. Alpha is the intercept. Remember, we've got the equation of a line is y is equal to a constant, alpha, or the intercept, plus beta times x. That's the slope. And we are after this guy right here. So that is the intercept down here. I'm looking at, this looks like, 0.016, so that's a negative alpha of 1.6%. That looks really good. And by the way, getting anything close to 1.6% alpha is awesome. It's difficult to find alpha because so many people are looking for alpha and they, they find something and they buy it or sell it and, and that drives the alpha out, right? It kind of causes the market to become more efficient. That's, think of it as not, not truly an arbitrage, but a quasi-arb, statistical arb, if you will. Um, so, yeah, 1.6 looks great, right? Until I look over here and I look at my T-stat. Bigger T-stats are always good. I want a high T-stat, and I want a low P-value. Well, and I know that the p-value can go from, you know, zero uh, all up to uh, one, because it's think of it as a percentage, and the t-stat can go from, you know, between negative uh, infinity and positive infinity. But right now it's very close to zero. So I'm looking at the absolute value of that thing, and it's not very big, and the p-value is quite large. I'd be looking for a p-value of 0.05 or 0.01 to 
to really believe that this alpha is not just a statistical aberration. But a p-value of 0.85, totally useless. I don't really have an alpha. I just have a statistical aberration here. So, and this is, this is something that your typical portfolio manager may or may not reveal to you. He or she may or may not even realize that. They're out there chasing alphas and find something. Boy, hey, I got an alpha. Let me run with it. Well, if I go back and I look at it historically and I run a regression like this, I might find that really what I have is just a variation, a periodic variation um, that isn't truly going to give me extra return. So be very careful of alphas. Information ratio is just another way of getting at whether that is truly a, a real alpha or is it simply a statistical aberration. I'm not going to spend any time on that. A actually, I think this regression method is, is a much more efficacious means of getting at that. But some people do calculate this information ratio. Morningstar is a great source for information about the, the various risk measures. If we go over to that, and I believe we're going to plug in there. Hang on a second. Let me get to my PowerPoint on my desktop here. Um, we're going to look at FLPSX. So if I plug in FLPSX as the ticker, and here I am with Fidelity Low Price Stock, and if I go to the Risk category, they've already calculated a lot of these measures for me. So I've got an alpha, I've got a beta, I've got an R squared, I've got a Sharpe ratio. I can look at all of these various measures and compare say, this uh, mutual fund to another mutual fund. In fact, I can look at not only, right now I've, I've, I'm looking at the three-year uh, horizon, but I could change that to five years, I could change that to 10 years, and it'll update uh, the information over here based upon the period that I choose. So if you're looking to compare various mutual funds or portfolios, uh, ETFs, whatever, uh, Morningstar is a great resource, and you don't have to do the computations yourself. It would be very tedious. Questions so far? Everybody all right? All right. Go back to that. And Okay, so let's, let's look at uh, calculating a couple of these things. Um, here we have some portfolios, A, B, and C. We're also given the market. We're also given the risk-free. And we're given the return on those portfolios, the standard deviation of the portfolios, and the betas of the portfolios. So let's, uh, let's do, do at least the sharp and the trainer ratios. So let's start off with uh, portfolio A. We have 12% and uh, 40 percent is the standard deviation, 0.5 is the beta. Uh, we also, so there's there's our R sub P, we're going to need the risk-free, which in this case is 5 percent. So, oops, let's see here. Well, that's weird, now it shows up. Very strange. All right, so if I want to calculate my sharp I'm going to start with my portfolio return minus my risk-free rate, and I'm going to scale that by my standard deviation, and I get 0 0.175. That's my sharp measure. On the same uh, portfolio with the uh, trainer measure, I'm just going to take the same numerator and I'm going to scale that by the beta instead, 
which in this case is 0.5, And I end up with a 0 0.14 trainer measure. And I'm always looking for the higher value, right? Because my numerator is my excess return. And I'm scaling it by risk. So um, now I, I can't necessarily compare across the sharp and the trainer. I can't say that, oh, the sharp measure is higher. Well, that, that's meaningless, right? So what I really need to do is I need to look at, let's look at security, or excuse me, uh, portfolio B, and that has a 30% standard deviation and a beta of 0.75. So 30 and 0.75, same numerator, and uh, so let's change this to 15%. Same risk-free rate, and so the sharp measure on this is going to be 0 0.333, and I'll get rid of the 0.3 and replace that with the beta, and I will get my trainer measure of 0 0.133. So now I could start comparing these things and I see that I get uh, a much higher sharp ratio on B, oops, I didn't mean to do that, <laughs> uh, than I do on A. In fact, now that we've done a couple of these, let me get rid of this altogether. And let me just reveal the, the rest of the values here for you in the lower table. So here are my sharp measures, here's my trainer, and I'm actually calculating my Jensen's alpha too. Remember Jensen's alpha, I'm simply taking the risk-free rate, 5%, plus beta, whichever, you know, whatever portfolio I'm in, I've got either a 0 0.5, 0 0.75, or 1.4 beta, and multiplying that by the market risk premium, which is uh, market return is 15% minus the risk-free rate of 5% gives me a 10% market risk premium. And that is the expected return based upon cap M. And I'm subtracting that return from my observed return here. So either the 12, the 15, or the 20%. And I'm getting an alpha of, in this case, 2%, 2.5%, and 1% on portfolios A, B, and C respectively. So now I can start looking at these things and saying, well, gee, if I use the sharp measure, here's my highest value. And that means that portfolio C seems to be the best performing portfolio out of these three based on sharp. But if I use trainer, trainer is actually arguing that portfolio A performs the best. And if I'm using Jensen Alpha, I get the most alpha out of portfolio B. So now I'm in a real quandary. Which of these do I actually care about? Well, it depends upon what the portfolio is and my purpose of looking at it. So if I'm evaluating the entire portfolio, sharp ratio is giving me a good measure. So if these are already well diversified portfolios, the R sub A, B, and C, then I'm going to go with Portfolio C. That's the, sharp, the highest value in the Sharpe ratio. However, if I'm evaluating a, a undiversified portfolio, or maybe even an individual security for inclusion into an already diversified portfolio, then I'm going to use either the Trainer or the Jensen's Alpha but I'm not going to hold that thing in isolation. Remember, I'm going to buy that thing and then include it as part of an already diversified portfolio. So that's how we uh, use each of these particular measures. So if I'm, if I'm looking for something to add to my portfolio, let's say I'm, I've got portfolio C 
and I'm evaluating A and B. Um, you know, if I look at Jensen's alpha, I'm getting more alpha out of B, and I might tend towards that one. Um, I could include A as well because, you know, its alpha is not bad at all either. It's quite good, actually. Uh, and the, the trainer ratios are relatively close on both of those as well. So, you know, it looks like both A and B would be good candidates for inclusion in my portfolio C. Questions so far about that? All right. Uh, the, your uh, authors talk a little bit about this global investment performance standard. It's a fairly complex uh, standard. It's been developed by the CFA Institute. And uh, the CFA Institute, as if you don't know, is the Chartered Financial Analysts uh, Institute. It's the, it's the organization that uh, administers the CFA exam and uh, owns the, the charter, the right to grant a CFA charter to uh, a group of individuals. And uh, they basically think of them as kind of a nonprofit organization that is the, the kind of the backbone of the uh, investments, uh, 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 individuals in the investments field. Um, you know, CFA charter is the gold standard. Think of it as uh, not unlike a CPA in terms of the credentialing. Um, many people these days end up going for a CFA rather than getting an MBA. Uh, you end up with a, 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 the marketplace, I guess I should put it this way. The marketplace values the CFA over the typical MBA these days much more highly. Uh, it's a very rigorous exam. But the CFA does other things, too. They, they develop a, a series of ethical standards that all charter members are required to uphold, uh, things of that nature. Um, they've also developed this global investment performance standards as a way of trying to help the investment world uh, come up with some sort of standardized method of benchmarking and evaluating various portfolios. Um, without going into the details of this, uh, the, the benefit is that if everybody were to adopt this uh, GIPS, then we could compare in a much more uh, level playing field one investment strategy to another, to another, to another. The biggest problem with it right now, because the, the underlying uh, method behind it is definitely efficacious, the biggest problem with it right now is that it, nobody has to do it. So it's up to the individual uh, investment company as to whether they rate their portfolio based upon the GIPS standards. Well, that presents a selection bias, right, folks? Selection biases are those things where we're going to get the, the firm that's doing really well based on a GIPS, and they're going to say, hey, I want you to. I, I want to show my portfolio rated on GIPS standards, and the firms that aren't doing so well based on GIPS are going to ignore it and say, no, 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 no. You ought to look at the Sharpe ratio, or you ought to look at Jensen's Alpha, or you ought to look at Trainer ratio. Those are what matter. So we don't have, really have a full population in this, but I think the idea is is valuable, and the CFA Institute is big enough has enough sway that hopefully they'll be able to make this thing stick and, and will come up with a much more consistent measure of performance rather than letting uh, investment companies kind of cherry pick the performance measure that makes their portfolio look the best. Medigliani and uh, Medigliani, this is actually a father-daughter uh, research team. So Medigliani is famous for his work uh, back in the 50s and 60s. Medigliani and Miller, um, they, they came up with a bunch of uh, very uh, highly valued research about uh, capital structure and things of that nature. His daughter also became a finance researcher. And the two collaborated on another measure. Your, your authors, for some reason, dropped... I think they dropped discussion of this in this edition of the textbook. I'm not sure why, 
Maybe they thought the chapter was getting too long. Uh, I think the M squared measure is is quite a valuable and very uh, uh, useful means of evaluating portfolio portfolio performance. Um, so the way this method works is we have some sort of uh, e adjusted portfolio. So we've got a portfolio P, and we're going to adjust that portfolio P. And we're going to do that by combining portfolio P with treasuries. So we're taking a risky portfolio and blending it with a riskless portfolio of treasury bills. Now, what the amount of that treasury bill portion of the portfolio is going to be set such that we move this portfolio star, this P star, so that it has the exact same standard deviation as the market portfolio, as the market index. Let's, so here we have the return on P star minus the return on the market. And if this measure, it's not really an exponential, right? It's just a a cutesy way of saying it's Medigliani and Medigliani. So the M squared doesn't represent, there's nothing exponentiated in this. It's just simply a difference between the two portfolio returns. But if this M squared is greater than zero, then I'm actually generating some positive excess returns adjusted for risk. If it's zero or less than zero, I'm not. So here's, here's an example of how that would actually work. Let's say, let me get all of this uh, in one spot. Let's say I have a managed portfolio, and the return on that portfolio over a period of time is 35%, and I've calculated the standard deviation of those returns, and they're 42%. I've got a market portfolio as well, and over that same period of time, I had 28% return and a standard deviation of 30%. And then I have a T-bill, which had returns of 6% over that same period. So I want to create, so this is my P portfolio. I want to create the P star portfolio such that I'm adjusting the risk of that portfolio, which clearly is significantly, well, I don't know about significantly, but it's clearly higher than the return of the market portfolio, or than the standard deviation rather of the market portfolio, 42 versus 30%. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine it in such a way that I'm shifting that uh, sigma p, uh, when I combine it with the risk-free rate, I'm shifting that down to uh, 30%. And the easy way to do that, because there is no risk in the risk-free rate, this is a linear combination instead of the, the usual, remember our, our portfolio uh, risk is uh, some sort of, um, Let's see, we've got the weight of A squared, the weight of, or excuse me, um, yeah. Let's see. And sigma A squared plus weight of B squared, sigma B squared plus two times A, uh, uh, ah, I'm moving too fast here. Uh, plus weight of A times weight of B times sigma A times sigma B times rho of AB. And I just barely had room. Oops. There we go. Now you can see. All right. So that's a nonlinear relation. Uh, the beauty of having a risk-free asset in there is that when the asset, let's call it uh, asset A, then that goes away because sigma squared of the risk-free rate is zero, so that goes away. Um, and this uh, correlation is zero, so that goes away. So I don't have this. Uh, I don't have this nonlinear relation. So I can calculate how much of the uh, uh, portfolio P I need relative to the T bill by simply taking the ratio of the standard deviation. So I take the market standard deviation divided by the uh, portfolio standard deviation, and that is 0.714 or 71.4% into the P portfolio and 28.6% into the T-bills. And that is going to 
lower the risk of that combined portfolio down to 30%. Now, I'm going to compare the returns on that P-star portfolio to the returns on the market. And I see that the P-star portfolio has 26.7% returns. And I'm comparing that to the market returns of 28%. So now on a risk-adjusted basis, I'm underperforming the market. So I'm better off with the market portfolio. If this had been, say, 29 or 30 or something else higher than 28%, then I would actually be getting something extra out of this risky portfolio. But because it's less than 28%, I don't want that P portfolio. That's, I, I can do better on a risk-adjusted basis simply by putting my money into the market as a whole, into the uh, passive portfolio. So that's M squared. Another thing, again, I'm not sure why the uh, authors chose to shorten up this chapter. I didn't see that they added anything in particular. So um, I don't know. Maybe it's because they did add a couple of extra chapters and they wanted to keep the total page count down. I, I have no idea. But they dropped out a couple of other things, too. Um, style analysis is another very valuable uh, method of of trying to understand what's going on in a portfolio. Again, back to some of the same old uh, folks back in the 50s and 60s that really began and built the foundations of the finance profession and the, and the research that we've done, Bill Sharp. Um, so here, what we're doing is, again, we're using a regression. We're using ordinary least squares, and we're regressing our fund returns on indexes that represent a various ranges of asset classes. So what's that mean? Well, let's go to the table that they present over here. So we're going to take the returns on a particular active managed portfolio, and we're going to regress it on these, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We've got seven other portfolios. Those are all going to be X's, X1, X2, x3 and so on so those are on the right hand side of our regression and we're regressing the returns on our actively managed portfolio on these seven x portfolios so the each of these portfolios represents a different asset class so here we've got risk-free of course small cap so small market cap uh, firms medium cap large cap and then we have high PE, medium PE, and low PE, a very common uh, segmentation. Uh, so you can see oftentimes uh, Morningstar will do this. You know, we put uh, capitalization on one axis and we put uh, PE on another. And we kind of get this uh, diagram where we've got nine categorizations. You know, if I've got low PE here and low cap, and then this is high cap and high PE, you know, whether a fund falls here or here or here, gives us some idea of what sort of returns we can expect. It also happens to correlate with the other two factors that Fama and French put, posited back in the 90s as uh, their three-factor Fama French model. So these are very common uh, segmentations that we might look at. So what, what we do is when we run that regression, we look at the coefficient estimates coming out of, oops, I just realized I'm way past time. I'm sorry. Uh, let me quickly wrap this up. Um, we look at the coefficient estimates and we see that this one loads, this one loads, and this one loads. And these other two, these, these two down here don't, neither do these two. So what we could say is that from a style perspective, even if we don't know what's in the portfolio, that portfolio very closely mimics a medium cap and most uh, has most focus on a large cap and tends to also have some high PE uh, characteristics in it. It's a combination of those three return series. Uh, so thinking about it from a style perspective is also very helpful way of evaluating a portfolio. And I do apologize for running over. Um, I will we'll continue on this on Thursday, wrap up chapter 13, do a few more problems, and then we'll get into 14 and 15 as well. So any questions before I shut things down? 
All right. I will see you all on Thursday. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good one. You too. Bye-bye.